joining the meeting in progress. Uh, two points of order. One, uh, due to the COVID-19 pandemic, the commission is meeting virtually. The meeting is being streamed live on the court's YouTube channel. Uh, second, uh, we will be taking roll call votes since uh, we are doing this by audio. And I'd also like, as we come through presentations, if folks have questions, you could make yourself known as having a question so that I can call on folks so we don't interrupt each other. Um, hopefully that will work. Um, with that being said, I'll call for a motion and second for approval of the minutes of the regular commission meeting on March 11th, 2020. Pam, if you could. So I, do, yeah, I move. Do we have a motion? Yes, yeah, I move. <laughs> second. Okay. Commissioners Alexander? Aye. Cooperal Comis? Aye. Lamb? Aye. Levy? Aye. Nimi? Aye. O'Halloran? Aye. Pierce? Aye. And Saruta? Aye. Thank you. Um, Curtis, if you could provide the executive director's report, please. You bet. Um, thank you, uh, Alice and commissioners. Good morning. Um, first, I, I, for those of you who can see it, I want to acknowledge the port's monthly safety champions this morning, especially in uh, these wild and weird times where safety is important to us, uh, both for our employees and for our partners and customers, passengers. Um, really appreciate uh, the folks on the team who are stepping up thinking about safety every day. Um, as noted, these are just unprecedented times. We've so much has happened since our last meeting. It's this month has been the longest decade of my life. Um, just really tumultuous and um, devastating impacts on our PDX community, workers and businesses. Um, for today, thanks for bearing with us. If we have any technology glitches, we're gonna do our best to uh, make this work. And, um, uh, you know, I'd say overall, we've been pleased how it's worked for port employees and working remotely. Um, I'm personally just really grateful to Port IT for getting us here. They've been very proactive in getting the organization ready for um, teleworking by moving to laptops and teleconferencing software, teleconferencing software probably uh, about a year ago. Um, here this morning in, in the commission meeting, Dan Pippinger and Keith Levitt will give you a, a full operations report related to COVID-19. But I wanted to share briefly in my ED comments what the port is doing to bridge the loss of revenue from passenger traffic, which is now hovering around 5 or 10% of normal. Um, first, as you all know, Congress passed a historic and, and bipartisan deal to provide over $2 trillion in economic re relief to Americans and businesses, including airlines and concessionaires and airports. Um, we're just really grateful for the support of our delegation um, and both Oregon senators, as well as our House leaders to include about $10 billion for airports in the final bill. Um, we expect those funds to help replace the really significant loss of revenues we've experienced so far and are still working through the details of what that will look like for the airport. Um, the port is also proactively implementing a number of temporary measures to um, mitigate financial impacts to the port, including a partial hiring freeze, eliminating uh, non-business critical travel, limiting overtime and training, restricting discretionary contracts, we're evaluating our capital and our maintenance spending to see if we can um, postpone, delay, stop projects uh, in the pipeline. Uh, in addition, last week I announced a furlough program to reduce expenses over the next 15 months inside the port. At its heart, we asked all port employees to take a month for the rest of this fiscal year, uh, a day a month, I'm sorry, um, for the rest of this fiscal year and the entirety of fiscal year 2021. And the executive team will take additional furlough days um, over what is asked of line employees. I'm really grateful to port employees for stepping up and making this work. Um, their commitment is what's gonna get us through this. Um, we'll continue to assess and implement opportunities to reduce costs and adjust operations to keep the airport safe and efficient in response to these changes uh, as we go. Our hope, honestly, is that we understand here in the summer 
really how bad it's going to be and what the shape of the recovery might look like, but we'll keep working as we go and, and keeping the, the full team up to speed on, on those changes as they come. I'll say personally, I have unwavering faith in our ability to get through this. At the same time, I have little hope that it's going to be easy. Um, it's going to be difficult, and I'm confident that we'll be able to do it together. So, Madam President, those are my comments this morning. Thank you, Curtis. So I'll ask for a motion and second for approval of the executive director's report. Madam so President, moved. I still move. Second. Thank you. Thank you. Pam, could you provide a roll call, please? <coughs> Commissioners Alexander? Aye. Cooper Comas? Aye. Lamb? Aye. Levy? Aye. Nimby? Um, aye. O'Halloran? Aye. Pierce? Aye. And Saruta? Aye. Thank you. Uh, we had asked for public comment to be provided to us by email so that we could share it with the commissioners, but we didn't receive any public comment this month, so we will move on to the general discussion items. I'll call on uh, Dan uh, Pippinger. Sorry? Uh, Pres President, can I ask just one question? Uh, you heard this uh, executive director relative to Certainly. the presentation that he just made. Thank you very much. Curtis, uh, you said in terms of uh, the uh, cost cutting uh i guess uh, the one of the uh efforts that uh, you at the port uh are making a day a month uh furlough uh how does that work and what does that mean to an employee and what does it mean to the port as a whole in terms of a month or a year yeah so um what it means for line employees is one day per month for the next 15 months, they're required to not work. They continue to receive benefits and are covered by uh, our health insurance or their health insurance, but um, the what would normally go into their salary or their wage for that day is saved by the port. Um, I asked the executive, executive team to take one and a half days a month and, and I will take two months the net effect of that savings is about $5 million um, toward what we're trying to get to, which is about a $20 million savings objective right now. Um, so honestly, uh, Commissioner, we'll see how it plays out. My Obviously, my hope would be that we recover faster than that, and it wouldn't be necessary to do the whole 15 months. But the objective here is to save cash in the short term um, and it, do everything we can to avoid layoffs of court staff. That, thank you very much. So that's a, a one day uh, unpaid leave per month. That's what Correct. it is, right? Correct. Yeah, that, that's what I thought. Thank you very much. Thank you, Commissioner. Um, I'll move on to general discussion items and call on Dan Pippinger and Keith Levitt for a COVID-19 operations update. Uh, thank you. Uh, good morning, commissioners. Uh, this is Dan Pippinger. Uh, I'll start and talk a little bit about um, all the operational impacts and measures we're taking. And then at the end of um, talking about aviation, uh, Keith will talk a little bit about the business side of it. And then we'll move on to marine and I'll follow up uh, the same way and then finish up with some other uh, comments. So uh, to start, I, I just would like to point out that when Paul, I talk to you. Sure with that. Good morning. Is when, now I talk, exiting. when I talked to you last uh, month, I mentioned that we have three primary goals, and those are still really uh, accurate, which is uh, the safety of personnel and reducing the spread of the virus in our facilities. Uh, the second was effective communications with both port employees, the workforces on our facilities, and then the public that uses them. And the third was business continuity in terms of allowing the operation to continue to serve essential functions for our community. And that third one also, I think, has grown and, and bifurcated slightly to also the fiscal continuity uh, that Curtis mentioned uh, and that we're working very hard on for both the port itself and for all of our business partners. Uh, as you know, uh, we're operating under the governor's executive order of stay home, stay healthy. Uh, which she issued last month and uh, also issued further restrictions on restaurants 
and retail uh, stores as well. And those have all had an impact on our facilities at PDX uh, in particular. Um, all of the port aviation and marine facilities are considered essential facilities sure and they Thank are um, open and operating today. Uh, for port employees, uh, you know, last month, joining. Uh, Curtis mentioned that um, on the 13th of March, uh, he directed uh, remote work for all employees that can do though that safely, uh, but noting that we have a, a number of essential staff uh, who come to work and uh, keep the operation going. And I just like to recognize the frontline staff at the port who are still serving the community uh, by working at the facilities. They're doing a great job in creatively managing sh shift segregations, modifying how they provide service to avoid unnecessary interactions, and going through a number of extraordinary efforts in both cleaning, uh, separation protocols, in some cases, temperature checks at critical facilities um, to keep uh, PDX, the general aviation and the marine terminals open and available uh, to our community. And I just uh, want to appreciate them uh, for that work. <clears throat> also, uh, last week, the Centers for Disease uh, Control, the CDC, uh, issued a new guidance on recommending that everyone wear face coverings uh, and um, we made that mandatory for all port employees coming to work uh, this uh, early this week. Uh, these are face coverings are not respirators or medical grade masks. They are merely face coverings and they're really intended to protect the people around you if you yourself are uh, uh, have the virus. Uh, but we also continue to stress that avoiding interactions and personal hygiene are much better uh, methods uh, to control the spread of the virus uh, and don't, um, you know, the face covering doesn't give you that false sense of security, uh, but we have put that in place. Uh, turning to PDX specifically, as Curtis mentioned, we're down approximately 94% uh, year over year on uh, individual days. Um, we have a couple of uh, flights still uh, flying to Mexico, but other than that, no international service. It's been a dramatic um, and rapid drop in uh, flight activity. And we're starting to see airlines publish new flight schedules uh, for the months of April and May and into June, which continue this um, uh, low uh, threshold of volume. And so I think, you know, in the, sh in the short run over the next two months, unless something dramatic changes, we think we're bouncing along the, the bottom here in terms of activity levels. Uh, hand in hand with that is a uh, revenue drop. Um, last month we were down uh, well over 50%. Uh, we would expect uh, even more difficult results in April because all of the revenue streams of uh, parking, uh, concessions, rental car operations are really tied to employments. And with them so low, we would uh, expect a commensurate drop in revenue as well. We've also made significant service adjustments at PDX. Uh, by consolidating uh, services, uh, closing facilities, a lot of uh, parking facilities, and uh, only uh, keeping some open to reduce operating costs. Uh, we've reduced a lot of customer service uh, capability, uh, non-health cleaning, uh, and things of that nature to uh, reduce our operating costs. And we're also actively working with the airlines to find parking uh, places for uh, a large number of uh, mainline airplanes uh, that really are just not in service right now. So we're trying to support them that way, but also generate some revenue as well. At, uh, at PDX, um, the big challenge is cash flow. Uh, that's true for the airlines, that's true for the rental cars, and that's true for our concession uh, tenants as well. And we have, with the airlines, uh, provided two months of deferred fees and rent from April and May to be paid back over four installments later this calendar year. For the concessions program, uh, we have um, gone to a percent rent uh, and provided operating flexibility and adapt, uh, allowing them to adapt to different uh, service models as well as closing if necessary. Uh, and we'll have to work through all that with them as well. 
In the meantime, as Curtis mentioned, the CARES Act was passed by Congress and signed by the president. Uh, we are in close contact with the airlines and our tenants uh, to make sure that they're aware of the provisions of those acts. And uh, we are interested in how they're um, going to be using those to support their workforces, to take small business loans, uh, to adapt service levels. Uh, and we're all working our way through uh, how that act is going to be um, implemented uh, around the FAA rules and restrictions and how we can access uh, those funds. And then finally, just on a, a quick note before I turn it over to Keith to talk about aviation uh, business in general, um, the Troutdale and Hillsborough airports also remain open, uh, but of course with extremely um, down activity. Uh, and we've also extended payment terms for tenants at those facilities as well to allow them uh, to get through hopefully a cash flow situation and back on their feet. Keith? Great. Thanks, Dan. Um, so. I'll just hear off of what uh, what Dan was saying about uh, the business and maybe talk a little bit more specifically about some of our key services and carriers. Um, so certainly a lot of uncertainty out there. That's that's the uh, the understatement. Um, our three largest carriers, Alaska, Southwest and Delta represent about 70 percent of the seats that are in our market. Uh, Alaska, when you look year over year, um, Alaska is down on daily flights, 140 daily flights a year ago at this time to 23 uh, today. Uh, Southwest 36 to 19 and Delta 31 to 12. So those are the capacity decreases that the airlines are now putting on their schedule. Um, that's not to say that they don't cancel flights further than that. And it's also not to say that the flights that are actually operational are full. They're not close to being full. They're at about 10 to 20 percent seat load factor. When normally I think you've heard us talk about a healthy load factor is around 85 uh, percent. So uh, pretty alarming, um, massive issues hitting the airline sector and certainly there's there's hope that the federal stimulus the cares act um, can help stand uh, these large airlines up for a few uh, more months and we can then start thinking about what a recovery uh, looks like uh, the summer schedule uh, many of you know that uh, we do a lot of international travel in the summer um, we typically would have five transatlantic flights. Uh, we would have our, uh, our Asia flight to Tokyo. Uh, you know that the Haneda flight was due to open on March 28th, something we had worked on for a good year and a half to two years to secure. All of that is on hold. Um, both on the Europe side as well as the Asia side for at least the next couple um, of months. Uh, on the transborder side, as Dan mentioned, we still have um, we have one flight now to Mexico with Belarus to Guadalajara. Uh, and uh, but all the rest of our flights to both Mexico and Canada um, are have ceased for the time being again hopefully reinstate those flights sometime uh, in the early summer. The bright spot for aviation certainly is air cargo. Uh, Cathay continues to provide three weekly 747 freighters uh, into PDX. This is more important now than ever, given the state of the economy and the fact that you've got a lot less belly cargo going out as passenger flights reduce it puts a much higher reliance on the freighter services. Um, so that's our one large international uh, freighter. Uh, they are such a great partner. I could go on and on about that. I won't at this time. Uh, this is the, the anchor cargo continues to be the aerosols that are produced by Nike here uh, and then sent off to factories uh, in Asia. Uh, and uh, we are thrilled that Cathay is continuing to serve our market. The domestic freighter services 
uh, with the UPS and the FedEx and the Prime Air. Those are all, as you would expect, with e-commerce and the need for medical supplies and all of that activity. That part is going strong, and there continues to be strong demand uh, for that type of cargo uh, service. So as, as Curtis mentioned earlier, I think our team, uh, from a commercial standpoint, we're staying close to our, our customers, the airlines, uh, the travel industry, which has been you know, devastatingly hit from this, uh, the local travel sector. Uh, and, you know, we continue to monitor kind of where the economy is going to ultimately be, what this looks like coming out the other side, and kind of what the key strategies are going to be for serving the market uh, going forward. So I'll stop there, and I'm going to kick it back to Dan to talk about marine operations. Uh, thanks, Keith. Uh, on the marine side, uh, we continue to uh, have our facilities open. Uh, part of our key activity there recently has really been uh, connectivity to the workforce, to the International Longshore and Warehousemen's Union, uh, the ILWU, uh, partnering with them on protocols uh, in terms of uh, distancing, uh, equipment uh, cleaning, PPE, and business continuity planning and uh, staying very close to them along with our stevedore at Terminal 6 uh, Harbor Industrial uh, so that we're all on the same page to keep the workforce healthy and uh, productive if possible. Um, we're also, just like we are on the aviation side, reaching out to our tenants on uh, both health issues and guidance that's been provided as well as um, the CARES Act and small business opportunities and other relief efforts either through FEMA uh, as well. Uh, the T6 uh, operation uh, continues. Uh, the SM line call, uh, weekly call, is uh, continuing. The volumes are fairly steady and the work is good. Uh, we are incurring a lot of increased costs uh, related to the cleaning and distancing, et cetera, that I talked about uh, for the workforce. Uh, but that uh, business model uh, looks uh, pretty uh, solid in terms of continuity right now. In addition to that, the T6 intermodal rail op, uh, operation, uh, sending uh, rail cars, uh, container, containerized cargo to and from the ports of Seattle and Tacoma to the Portland and Oregon region uh, also continues. It took a bit of a hit in terms of uh, volumes over the past couple months, but we have some uh, decent signs of some recovery going on in, in terms of the containers themselves. Other than that, all the other terminals are open. Uh, those operations are really run by the tenants themselves, uh, but they're open and Keith will talk a little bit about kind of the lineup and what we see for the cargo uh, for that. I'll just lastly mention that on the maritime side, uh, the screening of vessels coming in and out is done by the US Coast Guard and uh, conjunction with the um, CDC. And uh, we continue to partner with them in terms of any uh, regulations and restrictions around the movement of the vessels and crews on the vessels coming and going. Uh, and with that, Keith, I'll turn it over to you to talk a little bit about the marine business. Yeah, so at a business level, we're benefited by a diverse mix of lines of business that we're involved in. And so that really does give us the continuity that Dan was just mentioning. Um, it gives us some resiliency from a business model standpoint. The containers have been a real bright spot for us since SM started in January. Uh, those weekly calls have been consistent. Uh, the, the most recent calls have been our highest volume calls that we've had. This week's vessel had 222 export loads, uh, 211 import loads, 70 of which were from China. Uh, China is getting back online and one of the headwinds, one of the big headwinds in the market, in the container market for the U.S., China pushing a lot of this pent-up demand for inventory out of their factories as they begin to recover from the coronavirus. And there's a lot of cargo headed for the U.S. just when demand in the U.S. falls off. And so what we're going to see is a lot of what we call blank sailings, uh, blank sailings are when a carrier chooses to, to just miss, skip a port, skip a string. 
Um, we haven't seen that with SM yet, which is great, but we have seen that up in Seattle and Tacoma, uh, which has affected our rail business, uh, the rail shuttle that Dan was mentioning earlier. But ultimately, what you're probably going to see is inventory stacking up in warehouses in the U.S., uh, containers being staged at ports in the U.S. and not being emptied for the export cargo to move. And so that's probably the headwind we're most nervous about. We're an export-oriented uh, port. Uh, we're an export-oriented um, state. And we want to make sure the supply chain is working. So those are the headwinds that are out there. You're going to hear more about that probably next month. I would expect that the industry will be challenged uh, with the supply chain issue of, frankly, the, the huge differential between demand and supply coming into the U.S. Uh, the bright bulk business in the Columbia River, although we don't have calls coming directly to T6, uh, that type of business has gone as would be expected, has not really been impacted significantly so far from uh, the coronavirus. Autos are very much like what I just described, whole lot of inventory, uh, finished automobiles landing at the Port of Portland at terminals four and six, and cars not going to dealerships because demand has fallen way off. And so if you go out, if you were to go out to our terminals today or in the future, you're going to see just an endless sea of finished automobiles kind of waiting to be distributed to uh, end users and dealerships uh, in the U.S. because demand has fallen off. So that's another big, it's an opportunity uh, for us. To, Rob Levy, I'm going to step out for a minute. A couple of you guys. Okay, uh, it's, it's an opportunity from a short-term revenue standpoint for us. Um, but again, just another uh, symbol of what's happening uh, with the market. Bulk facilities um, going well. Uh, soda ash, we have nine vessels in the queue for April. Potash, four vessels uh, coming this month. Uh, grain looks to be stable right now. This tends to be a little bit of a downtime from a grain volume standpoint, but we do expect there to be pretty decent grain volumes uh, throughout the year. And just as Dan mentioned, the, the partners in the river, the steamship operators, the federal agencies, the longshoremen, our workforce, everybody's working very well together right now. And I'm very grateful for that. Uh, Dan, I'll kick it back to you. I, I'll cover some properties update. Um, I can do that. Okay, I'll do that now. Um, quickly on the properties uh, front, our team, just a reminder, uh, through our four major industrial parks, through our airside leasing that we do at the airports, uh, we're home to some 30,000 direct, indirect, and induced jobs. Uh, and so we keep a close eye on what's happening. Uh, this, these are mostly companies that are small and large in the traded sector, they're in the transportation sector. Uh, some have been very, very impacted by uh, the stay-at-home order, some have not, um, and we we have been a conduit of information flow about the stimulus packages uh, with the CARES Act and what's happening at the state and regional level. Uh, Brookings recently came out with 26 percent uh, with a slide deck that talked about small business, and, and it said 26 percent of small business establishments fewer than 250 are in immediate risk of closure. Um, that, that is very alarming to a small business state like Oregon. Uh, a lot of us are serving on various task forces right now. I'm on the governor's COVID economic task force. Uh, and most of that activity is around how do you funnel uh, capital uh, cash to these businesses while um, we have these stay at home orders in place and how do they keep employees employed because once a business closes it's very hard to get it back up on uh online uh so that's kind of at the high level what we're working on um, our team is working directly with our tenants uh, dan mentioned the deferment of rent 
uh, for 60 days. We've offered that to our airside uh, tenants as well. Uh, the governor put out an executive order on non evictions for rent for 90 days. Um, we, of course, will be following that as a, uh, a landlord. Many of our businesses are operating because they're in that industrial, more essential business. So logistics is actually, you know, very busy. Um, the fulfillment centers at Troutdale and at Rivergate are hiring people. Um, E-commerce obviously is booming right now. Um, and of course, the, the medical supply piece is a part of that. Manufacturing is more of a mixed bag. What we're seeing is uh, some companies are shutting production, uh, at least temporarily. Daimler Trucks is an example of that out at Swan Island. Uh, they've, they've closed their, their truck plant uh, for the next foreseeable future. Uh, Boeing has done that uh, with their, uh, their aircraft plants, but their Gresham parts plant is open, uh, which is good news. Element 6, our synthetic uh, diamond manufacturer in Gresham is fully operational. Uh, and as we all know, construction um, continues and is a, a pretty important part of uh, the overall economy right now. Uh, the last thing I'll just say is that our staff is, uh, we'll be able to get into details. I'll keep it kind of general, but you can imagine that that the port with our expertise in transportation and logistics and our relationships uh, with service providers, uh, we have been pulled into various efforts uh, to help fight the COVID uh, crisis and we're busy working with partners to help uh, supply PPE, help warehouse PPE for the medical industry um, through our, our air cargo efforts, as well as through our real estate uh, side. Uh, we've, we've worked for, we've worked with the city of Gresham at the mayor's uh, request to work with our partners to get containers donated um, as part of uh, their food bank efforts uh, in the community. And, that's a small list. Um, our staff is just doing really great work. All of our port staff doing great work out in the community. So with that, I will stop there. Uh, thank you. Um, just uh, two other quick items. Uh, one is the navigation mission, uh, the Dredge Oregon. Um, we uh, are still uh, working full time there in terms of preparing for the upcoming dredging season and maintaining the equipment uh, to be ready for that. Uh, so that mission uh, has not been directly impacted right now, other than, uh, you know, staff safety, social distancing, uh, PPE, et cetera. Uh, and then on our capital front, as Keith mentioned, um, uh, all of the port's capital projects that are open and constructing uh, have continued to do so. Um, we are doing a thorough review of our capital program right now in conjunction with our uh, need to revise our fiscal year 21 budget and looking at those capital projects that are not under construction, even if they've been improved, excuse me, approved and are in design and then other ones that have just come forward to just get approved and, and deciding what we can safely defer, uh, what's not mission critical or safety critical uh, uh, to move on as well. There have been some uh, minor workforce availability issues on some of the construction projects. Uh, but at this time, those impacts are minimal and haven't affected any of the critical paths of those projects. Uh, but we are very cognizant about um, the safety measures being taken on the construction sites with our contractors and are active with them in making sure that we're following all of the CDC and Multnomah County and governor's orders and guidelines that have been out. Uh, we're also super focused on the permitting issues because, of course, other uh, jurisdictions are also uh, working remotely, and uh, so we're working very closely with the city of Portland to <clears throat> keep the permitting in line with um, the construction projects themselves. That's uh, the update from Keith and from me, and uh, if there's any questions, we'll be happy to answer them. Thank you. Thanks, Dan and Keith. Uh, would commissioners with questions please identify themselves? A lot of information there, I'm sure. We have some yeah, questions. Yeah, this is uh, uh, Commissioner Suruda. Just one quick question. I don't know to whom this question uh, uh, will go to. Probably uh, uh, Executive Director uh, Curtis. Uh, 
Uh, uh, in terms of uh, social distancing and uh, you know trying to encourage uh, as much as possible uh, working uh, remotely uh, for the purpose of your uh, employees, uh, what is the day-to-day uh, atmosphere or the headcount uh, right now at the headquarters offices look like on a scale of one to ten? About twenty percent of the normal, I guess, uh, the uh, headcount, or fifty percent, or, or business as usual. Yeah, do thank understand, you. Do you understand thank my question? I do, um, okay. and I'm going to defer part of it to Dan Pippinger. I'll say in the headquarters, it's uh-huh. uh, it's under 20 people showing up each day, so it's much less than. Patricia McDonald. Much less than now 10%. Joining. Uh, it, mm-hmm. It's probably in headquarters between 15 and 20 people showing up each day and we've instructed Uh them both this requirement that Dan mentioned with the uh, face covering if they have to be in proximity of one another uh, Mm -hmm. also to to maintain safe distancing practices so it's a very small number if you think our our regular um, contingent at HQ is above 300 350 uh, you know and that's um, in addition then we have another hundred or so contractors usually it's uh it's under five percent um so it's pretty lean dan pippinger will you just speak to the other folks um uh, sure in on hq roles sure out, out in the field um mm-hmm. we probably for for many of the groups we've gone to i guess we'll call it a split shift model where <clears throat> we're actually asking some people to just to stay at home for a number of days and then come in and work for a couple of days instead of everybody coming in at the same time. So we're trying to do that to break up the shifts and prevent any kind of um, uh, any outbreak or spreading if somebody on one of the shifts was sick. So in general, a lot of the groups may be down to about half staff and we're you know, also trying to not do any work we don't have to do that's in proximity to others. There are exceptions to that. Uh, the fire department's a great example where there's a minimum staffing level that we must have to uh, maintain functionality. And uh, in that case, we're at full staff, uh, but trying to be very cautious between the shifts and the connectivity. And uh, that's one group that's really going to um, some extraordinary measures to wear the proper gear, even when they're just in the firehouse with each other and uh, doing checks uh, when people come to work. So uh, for some groups, it's 100%, but for most, it would be about half uh, on the operational side. Thank you very much. Uh, uh, I am fully understand. And uh, many of those functions, uh, Curtis, uh, as well, are not uh, what we call doable remotely, right? So basically, you are requiring people to keep distance uh, for the purpose of safety, right? Correct. Thank you very Correct. much. There, th- there are a few uh, in the building, Commissioner. For example, payroll and accounts payable <laughs> processing that in order to maintain our business operations, they simply can't be done remotely. And um, the comm center is another example. These are people who are required on site. And so we're trying to, as much as possible, uh, manage around the requirements to be there and um, safety of our employees. So yes, you're, you're absolutely right. Thank you very much. Thank you. Any other questions? Okay, hearing none, we'll move on to our uh, first agenda item. Dan, if you could uh, introduce the first agenda item, please. Uh, Thank you um, very much. Uh, This item, is uh, the ratification of a collective bargaining agreement for the Port of Portland Police Employees Association. Uh, We've been in bargaining uh, really for the past two years. And just as a reminder how critical and important the uh, police department is to the port, uh, a lot of their activity is directed around both patrol for criminal acts, traffic violations, and the maintenance of public um, order, uh, but also crime prevention, Uh, calls for service and investigation uh, activity as well. Uh, They're also very active in organized crime and drug trafficking task force uh, to prevent money laundering, identity theft, narcotics interdiction, and human trafficking, 
uh, all types of activities that uh, are sometimes seen at the airport. Uh, so we're here today to request approval of a negotiated four-year collective bargaining agreement with this uh, Port, uh, Police Association. And Blaise Lamphere, the Labor Relations Manager, will present this item for your consideration. Blaise? Thank you, Dan. Uh, good morning, Commissioners. Um, this item, as Dan mentioned, uh, we have been in bargaining, also mediation, and headed to interest arbitration uh, over the course of uh, an extensive, uh, basically a 22 month period. Uh, that interest arbitration was scheduled for three days in April. Uh, we were able to avoid it uh, by coming to a tentative agreement uh, with the police union on February 14th. Um, to show you how much our world has changed, that was two weeks before the first reported or confirmed COVID-19 case. Uh, here in Oregon. So uh, this was uh, long into uh, production, if you will, uh, by that time. And uh, you will see that reflected in the items we, we cover in this, uh, in this particular agreement. Uh, we are, when we look at um, any contract or enter into any uh, collective bargaining, we look at primarily at, at market and market competitiveness. And uh, to maintain competitiveness or achieve it if we are falling below that uh, and focus on attraction and retention for the particular classifications uh, covered by an agreement. We also look at uh, CPIW uh, for about 30 years. Uh, we were under uh, primarily the Portland Salem uh, second half index that was eliminated and last reported in 2018. And we moved to the west size uh, class A cities with most of our contracts um, at that time as uh, a most suitable index to uh, gauge shifts in the economy in this area. And uh, then we also look at internal comparability, uh, particularly uh, one union to another, but also uh, in terms of our admin uh, uh, employees and population uh, and what we may have done in terms of pilot programs with them or some of the other units uh, throughout. So that all heavily influences uh, where we go in our collective bargaining uh, under the uh, Public uh, Employee Collective Bargaining Act, PECPA, uh, here in Oregon, which governs that relationship. Uh, next slide, please, Steve. Quick question. What is a CPI, not the Consumer Price Index, right? Yes, the, price. Oh. the Consumer Price Index, uh, the, the oh, double. That's what you mean. Oh, okay. Yes, yes, that's that's correct. Okay. So we use that, uh, the one for West uh, size Class A cities primarily. So in uh, the terms of the agreement, we looked at a four-year deal. The union initially looked at a three-year uh, deal, and historically we have done uh, both threes and fours. Um, the first two years of uh, this agreement were okay, already well into year two. Um, there were two fours uh, as retro uh, for this. Again, I, I stress that uh, while fours are not common uh, in our contracts, in this particular case, we were able to justify that in terms of maintaining competitiveness uh, in the marketplace and uh, ensuring attraction and retention. Uh, the third year, the 2.9 is based on that index. Uh, that's a hard number now and was reported in January for CPIW West Class A second half. And um, the fourth uh, year of scheduled uh, wage increase, uh, the floor 2.5% in the high uh, made a lot of sense on February 14th. So that's uh, that's year four. Um, in health and welfare, uh, I stress that we didn't have uh, many changes, but these were areas of contention uh, that prolonged, I think, uh, the negotiation between the parties considerably. Um, about five years ago, they were the first union uh, to move in the direction that the port was wanting to move uh, with its admin and uh, with its employee population toward a, a high deductible health plan uh, replacing a traditional uh, PPO uh, or um, and in uh, health maintenance organization uh, in in Kaiser uh, is also maintained and they will be staying on existing coverage. They look to go during the course of negotiations to um, a trust like fire, uh, but the union dropped that uh, proposal 
in the course of negotiations. The monthly premium course uh, cost share uh, is 92.8 as it is for many of our unions, uh, most of them and uh, all of them that are currently on uh, uh, healthcare through the port. Uh, they look to go to 95.5 and, and did drop that as well. Uh, HSA contributions uh, were unchanged uh, for the duration of this CBA. That was important because it could have triggered bargaining in other contracts uh, that we have. And uh, we got over that hurdle and the port retains oversight of the wellness program it initiated um, some years ago and over program design so that we have some flexibility and don't have to go back to the table uh, every time we want to uh, change it slightly or offer more um, opportunities for employees to earn credits toward their wellness. Uh, next slide, please. Uh, in holidays, the area of holidays, we gave two additional holiday comp days, uh, primarily because, uh, again, this was market driven and considering uh, where we were in terms of our health care coverage, um, this uh, fit in nicely in terms of being able to justify it um, with the market and overall compensation. Uh, we looked at vacation. That was an, an area of interest for the union where they uh, wanted to expand uh, some vacation time uh, considerably. We always have to consider the cost of backfill uh, of positions um, in these types of situations uh, with an organization such as uh, the police department. Um, we did not have an increase in uh, the 10 to 14 year band of service. Uh, but we did increase uh, for 15 to 19. So we split the original band of 10 to, uh, 10 to 19 years into 10 to 14 and 15 to 19 uh, with the only addition coming in uh, because of the market um, for 15 to 19 with an additional days of accrual. Uh, but that does not, there's no retroactivity in that. That begins uh, July 1st of this year. Uh, the duration of bargaining was also influenced mightily by the Janus decision, the Supreme Court decision in June 2018 that affected so many uh, public sector contracts around the country uh, because it prohibited some existing language and trickled, triggered bargaining. Next slide. Uh, looking at the estimated financial impact uh, through the life of the CBA, uh, the estimated impact is three million, uh, so three point two million dollars. Uh, here, uh, what you're seeing in the yearly increase is new dollars, new money above where it was uh, the cost uh, the previous year. So this includes the full boat, as opposed to just the year-to-year -year increments there. Uh, this is the full cost over the uh, four years, uh, as we estimate it. Uh, uh, at $3.2 million. From a good faith perspective, we landed in a good position because last fall when we filed for interest arbitration, that was the value of our package. So uh, we ended up settling uh, on the amount where we were at uh, back in September, ultimately. Next slide. Uh, so the recommendation the executive director approval to enter into four year collective bargaining agreement with the Port of Portland Police Employees Association. Quick question, may I, Tom, through with that? Yes. Yes, please. Thank you. This uh, total increase over life of CBA, uh, $3.283,000 uh, rounded. Uh, how many employees uh, uh, subject to this uh, uh, agreement or covered under this? Um, it'd be if you included all the vacancies uh, with police uh, and the dispatchers, uh, uh, it is 74 currently. 74, so did 74, three. okay, I understand. Thank you, that's all. Yes. Uh, this is Bob Levy and I rejoined uh, at the start of the presentation. Thank you, Commissioner. Um, Commissioner Sarut asked my question, which was the size of the bargaining unit. Are, are there other questions? Okay, hearing none, I'll call for a motion and second to approve the executive director's recommendation. So I will move. So moved. Second. 
Oh, Pam, could you call, lead us through the roll call, please? Yes, Commissioners Alexander. Aye. Cooperal Comas. Aye. Lamb. Aye. Levy. Aye. McDonald. Aye. Nimi. Aye. O'Halloran. Aye. Pierce. Aye. And Saruta. Aye. Thank you. I uh, will now have uh, Vince Granado to introduce the next agenda item. Okay. Uh, good morning, Commissioners. Uh, George and I are back for another amendment to the Hoffman Skanska contract uh, for work on some interim facilities in the terminal um, as we start to get ready for uh, some demolition that's going to happen. But before, we thought it'd just be good to give an overall status of the entire program. Uh, just touch on a little bit more of what Dan was also and Keith were talking about from a COVID-19. Um, so, um, you know, the governor's executive order is allowing us to continue to operate. Uh, PPX were considered um, critical infrastructure for the region. The city of Portland has also designated uh, the, uh, the PDX work as a tier one um, uh, operation. So we're, you know, very uh, thankful and supportive of those decisions. Uh, obviously, that's uh, helping the economy move with the with the work that still needs to get done, uh, but obviously also very focused on health and safety of the uh, certainly the employees, contractors. So we're making sure that uh, every one of our construction partners uh, is abiding by the highest safety standards. They're doing the separations, uh, social distancing, um, any investigations. We've not had any positive. Tests. There have been a couple where we've taken some tests and uh, we've come back in and cleaned the site and then uh, quarantined those folks, but we haven't had any of that. Um, no official uh, confirmed cases at this point in time. So, um, you know, on the positive side, it really helps keep, there's about 1,250 people working um, and supporting their families and lots of small construction firms uh, that are working as well uh, during all of this. You know, when we look at the PDX Next program, it was designed to upgrade outdated facilities, make us more seismically resilient, uh, prepare for growth, and those needs really haven't changed. Um, so obviously some of the timelines um, in terms of when we get to, you know, 34 million annual passengers, which is what the Terminal Core is designed to do, we'll, we'll have to look at that. But overall, uh, the fundamentals behind the projects still remain in place. So. Um, we're just trying to make sure that the program moves forward um, and really is set up to serve our region um, out into the future. Um, so I thought what I'd do is show a few pictures of each of the projects that are uh, happening right now. So if I can get to the next slide. So this is the Concourse E extension um, where Southwest will be operating. This is the six gates. Um, and right now what you're looking at here is uh, you're sort of at the entry to it. You're looking uh, eastbound out to the end of Concourse E, which you have on the left side of the screen are some rolls there. That's the carpet, um, which is being acclimated into the space. It has to sit there for a little bit and get used to being in, inside. Uh, so we're about two weeks uh, away from um, starting to install the carpet. You can see the moving sidewalks to the right of the picture, um, lots of ceiling tiles, uh, a lot of the ceiling is going in. So um, overall work continues pretty well. We have had some, um, maybe five to 10% of uh, attendance. Some of that's just folks obviously dealing with their kids and families in, in this uh, time period. The original intent was to have uh, this project uh, done by June 16th. The reality is we still can be open by June 16th. Uh, it wouldn't be complete, but if Southwest is ready to move at that point in time, uh, we could certainly uh, do that and get them the gate capacity. So uh, in conjunction with the operations team, we're uh, spending a lot of time with Southwest to, to find out exactly what their plans are and, and uh, whether they'll be ready to go. When you think about the concessions, there were 10 uh, concessionaires uh, on uh, that have spaces on the new concourse. Six of them have continued to work um, and are trying to uh, get open by that June 16th date, or at least be ready to if we decide to open the facility. 
um, four have, have been delayed. So uh, we're thankful that, um, that folks are still able to, to continue their work there. Um, if you can go to the next slide, please. So this one um, is kind of looking a little bit north and west out onto the airfield. You've got floor to ceiling windows there. Uh, this is where Stumptown uh, will be located. Uh, and just to the left of that, of those uh, big tall windows there, those are gates E7 and E8, um, uh, where Southwest will be operating. Uh, and again, more, uh, this is an area where the terrazzo is, uh, is gonna be going in. So, um, Overall, lots of good progress on Concourse E. Uh, we still expect to finish the project on budget at $215 million. We still think we can make the June 16th date uh, as long as Southwest uh, wants to move in. And we'll just uh, figure out how to, how to make that happen here. So uh, overall, the full, the full project won't be done by that June 16th date. It's probably pushing out into uh, late July or early August. Um, but uh, overall, it's still moving ahead um, pretty well. Uh, let's move on to the next slide, please. So this is uh, the parking garage project. Um, and um, so this is uh, uh, parking and rental cars, our consolidated parking garage. And uh, so this part here, these are called pile caps. This is where the steel will be erected. Um, for the parking garage. So what you're doing is you're standing uh, basically on kind of on the upper roadway and looking east. To the right of the screen, you've got uh, concrete there. Those are pile caps. And then the ones in the middle are getting formed and ready for that. And then the left, you can see there's just the piles themselves. Um, so we're in, in the process of finishing off the pile caps and then there'll be a full slab of concrete that goes on top of that um, before the steel gets erected. The plan is to start steel erection uh, here in about on April 20th um, for the rental car center, which I'll get to in a second, but the parking um, garage itself, we're still evaluating what the timeline is on that. Um, obviously we don't need additional parking capacity uh, right now but there is still a rental car function that needs to be accommodated. And so we're, we're working through those details. Uh, if you can go to the next slide, please. So this is the rental car center. You can kind of see to the right is airport way. Uh, and you can see where the max line um, would be over there uh, on the right hand side as well. This is the four story office building and the main floor is where the rental car customer service um, facility will be, and then the floors up on top of that, two, three, and four, will uh, house port office um, folks, including police. Uh, TSA is going to move over there. These are other <laughs> tenants that are in the terminal core um, uh, uh, area for construction that we're moving out that are in the mezzanine today. So we'll move the comm center and such. So you can see there's a lots of activity going on here towards the back left of that you can see some uh, a couple of cranes but there's a big concrete sort of a bunker in there what that is is actually a water supply we're making this building to be fully resilient uh, operationally resilient so that in the event of a uh, of an event uh, a seismic event the facility will be able to operate and function so it has its own water source there for a period of time in case it gets cut off from the rest of the, uh, the services so this is where our main emergency operations center will be in the future. So we are still proceeding here. This is uh, where the steel will begin on April 20th, and it'll take about a month to get the steel um, up on that part of the building, which gives us time to decide about the timeline uh, for the rest of the parking and the rental cars. Um, let's see if we can move on to the next. Um, so then I'll turn over to George. We don't have any pictures yet of Terminal Core. Uh, we'll keep you updated on that. Uh, other things that are happening right now, the TriMet platform is closed at the terminal building. We're running a bus bridge from Cascade Station into the terminal for the next 60 days. That's allowing us to uh, demolish the portion of Concourse A that's right next to the light rail tracks. Um, so uh, that'll be happening here in the next 30, 60 days. And then we move into Concourse B 
for demolition. Um, and, and so I'll try and get some pictures of that next air, uh, next month, uh, when the next time we come. So that's kind of the, um, the update on the project. I'd be happy to answer any questions on that, uh, or we can just go straight into George and have him run through this, this contract. Can I have just one or two Since questions? This is Commissioner McDonald, and I wanted to make sure I heard correctly when yeah. you were describing the rental car center, that that will um, be fully resilient in case of an event. And then did you also say it will house the EOC in the future? And were you referring, which EOC were you referring to for the whole port of Portland or did I misunderstand that? So one, uh, one floor of that building will be fully resilient um, and it's for our emergency operations center. So we're not making the entire building, the structural will be, but one floor there. So we're doing everything with the IT rooms to separate them uh, from the rest of the structure and do all the things that are necessary to ensure that. The rest of it obviously is still gonna be uh, fire life safety and, and meet that code, but um, the area where the, uh, the port's emergency operations center, which is currently uh, above Concourse C right now, is gonna move over um, into that uh, building. Okay, thank you. I have a, a question. This is uh, Tom Suruta, may I? Yes, sir. Thank you. Uh, uh, in terms of uh, uh, the uh, seismic resiliency, uh, what does it mean to uh, lay people like uh, ourselves? That's number one. Number two, in terms of uh, securing water supply uh, in case of uh, 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 a given situation, does that entail digging your own well uh, separate from the uh, city's water line supply? Another question I have is, in, and I'm not trying to be funny here, but I'm just curious. Uh, earlier uh, in your, one of the slides, you said the carpets are being placed there for acclimation to indoor uh, elements. What does that mean? I mean, uh, to get used to the indoor uh, uh, amount of light, lighting or the moisture, therefore a uh, carpet will not shrink later? Uh, what does it mean? Those are three questions I have. Uh, okay, let me see if I can, I'll take them in reverse order. Uh, yeah, on the carpet, it does need to just get acclimated to temperature and moisture. So it's been, you know, on trucks or wherever it's been. Um, and so it has to just sit and be prepared uh, in the new space that it's going to go in to make sure that it, it does expand uh, into where it is. You don't want to put it in when it's too cold because um, obviously it could, um, it could change. So that's just an, uh, a standard acclimation. Okay. Um, so then let's let's go back. So uh, uh, on the water supply, we are connected into the the city's system, but we have built a large um, concrete tank. I guess is what I would is what I would say. Um, and so we will use. That, that concrete tank will be available for us if we happen to get shut out. So it's not a well, and it's not a, it's not a permanent um, well that we're using. It will sustain us for a certain period of time if we happen to be cut off from the system. That's okay. the intent of, of what that is for. Vince, okay. that's, that's for four days. Four days, okay. Yep. Thank four you, George. Days. Sure. Mm -hmm. uh, and then, um, and George, maybe you can help me on this too. The seismic standards, um, there, I, I want to say there are like four levels of uh, seismic um, um, construction. And, you know, you can be completely fully operational. It will sustain, uh, it'll withstand everything and you're ready to go. I think that's level four. Level three is you are operational and you can still function um, for a certain period of time. And then fire, and then uh, level two is like a fire life safety. People can get out of the building. And then there's a level one, which um, you know is, is not going to do well. And so where we're designing this is basically to three of the four uh, of those levels, um, so that uh, we'll be designed to be operational. There will be some things uh, that that won't work, but the critical functions will be able to um, still happen for periods of time. Is that that right, George? 
Yes, yes, very good. So, so, so the idea is the structure will stand throughout the earthquake and be and and survive. Um, the building will still shake, but some of the some of the critical functions will be on on um, isolation uh, floors, so they survive and function right after the earthquake. But you have to put thing have to put things back together afterwards, so it's it's repairable, but it will but it, but it will function after the earthquake. Well, so the, uh, the that's what what you guys uh, refer to as complete resiliency, right? So what is that based upon in terms of uh, expected or the uh, threshold magnitude? So it's ex it, it's it's designed around the uh, the the nine earthquake. Oh, nine earthquake. That yep. that concludes my question. Thank you very much. Thank you. Uh, Vince, this is Allison. My question goes uh, to your presentation as well as to um, what George will bring, which is that, you know, I, I take your point that uh, many of the reasons why we decided to move forward with these projects in the first place um, still exist and, and may occur more slowly than we expected, but will still occur. Um, I want to get a sense of what our risk is here with respect to the airlines and their I know that they are technically obligated to pay the costs of many of these um, facilities, not all, but many of them. Um, and what else do they have, I guess, is my question uh, in, in terms of bearing those expenses. Um, well, yeah, they are they are obligated. These projects have all been approved by them. They've not all been completely funded at this point in time. So the Concourse E uh, project has is fully funded. Terminal Core is not uh, fully funded at this point in time. So they have approved the 1.65 billion in total. Uh, they're not paying for it so far right now. Basically they're paying for the design. Uh, those bonds were issued last year. Uh, and so our financial plan has been to use our commercial paper program uh, to continue to fund this until we go out into the market to fully fund the rest of the program. Now, the bond market is a little unstable right now, to uh, put it mildly, um, and it's something that we're working with the finance team on, what is the right um, schedule to go out and get the rest of, of, of the bonds. So now, in theory, again, that's how the airlines, uh, to that's how they pay us back, um, will be over time. But the way it works is when you actually issue the debt, it's two, almost two years after the debt gets issued before they start to pay it back. So it's part of our calculus is to figure out, okay, when do you issue the bonds? What do the costs look like going forward? How quick does passenger traffic return? So we're working with the finance folks on that to kind of see what options that we have. I think it's one of the reasons why we've done the shorter term cost control is to try to mitigate those things going forward. Um, so, that's, that's what our plan is. Uh, so right now they're not really paying for much of it. Um, certainly on the terminal core, that's further down the road. I'm not sure if that gets to your question or not. Uh, I, I think it does. I think generally my question was maybe a little more precise, which is um, will the airlines have an ability at some point to try and renegotiate what they've already agreed to? Gotcha. Uh, well, technically, no, uh, not in terms of what the, uh, the airline agreement states. Now, they have certainly come to us, and, and Dan can probably speak to this as well. They've asked us to do everything that we can in the short term to reduce your operating costs, defer your existing capital. Uh, will they come back and say, hey, can you delay Terminal Core at all? And I think we are prepared to answer those, those questions because, again, when you look at the business case, for that, uh, we still think it makes sense. You know, a lot of this is designed for seismic resilience. Uh, we've seen earthquakes in Salt Lake, uh, Boise, Coos Bay. So those things, to me, are still in in place. Uh, a flexible facility that um, uh, to meet the needs of a changing passenger processing experience, which I would exper uh, which would I would expect that uh, we're going to be seeing here going forward. So I, I think the business case is still there for it. Will they come back and ask us? Yeah, and I think for us, it's a matter of what can we do um, from a cost perspective. You know, you, you don't want to delay 
um, for a significant period of time because you actually it ends up, it ends up costing you more as long as you're still going to continue to do the work. So that's the balance that we're trying to create with them. Uh, Madam President, this is Mike Alexander. Please go ahead. I have a question, and and it's really a piggyback um, from the question that was just asked. I know that um, that was directed at concern around airlines potentially renegotiating the terms of the agreement with with PVX. I guess I'm concerned about the long-term viability of several carriers who um, may not recover from this and what impact that could potentially have on the projected revenues if there are fewer airlines involved in actually underwriting the expense. So the way, the way the agreement works is they are basically all self-insuring amongst themselves. Uh, so if, for example, a smaller airline uh, does not make it, then what happens is the other airlines pick up their share of what those costs are. So what we have, one of the things that's uh, the value that the port has here in Portland is that we aren't really dominated necessarily by one carrier who has 70 or 80 percent of the market. Now, Alaska has 42-ish, something like that, but we are reasonably spread out between Alaska, Southwest, uh, and Delta are really the big, the big three here. Um, so uh, it would have to be where I think multiple airlines maybe were not surviving that all of a sudden that load just ends up um, uh, all on the, the top one or two airlines. So that's certainly the, uh, a risk for us as you look forward out there. But I think the fact that we're relatively evenly distributed amongst our top, I want to say, four or five carriers um, certainly bodes well for us. It's, it's what the, the rating agencies also look at um, when they evaluate um, our, our debt is how reliant are you on just one carrier? So, uh, you know, that, that is certainly an operational issue for us, um, that you end up with maybe only three, four, five airlines instead of the eight, nine, ten that we've got, which is better for passengers, better for pricing. Um, but we think overall we're in, we're in pretty good shape in that respect. Great. Thank you. Any other questions? I think George, you still uh, had information for us. Yes, I'm, I'm back online okay. now. So I've, I've, okay. I've been dropping off a couple times, so I'm back. <laughs> so, uh, so, so today we're asking for some for the approval of an amendment to the Hoffman Skanska contract to provide for some interim work activities and logistical support for $31 million. Next slide, please. So here's an image of the roof that you've seen a couple of times. Um, over the last couple of months, Commission has approved the, the column enabling uh, work to prepare the installation of the columns as well as the uh, um, um, prefabrication and logistics yard areas. Next slide. Here's an image we shared last month about the actual installation of the roof itself. This is kind of as the as the site will look in as long as the schedule holds in in February of 22, which would include uh, the demolition of the existing roof structure and the mezzanine at the at the Oregon Market uh, to really to 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 free up the entire 1956 building for construction. Um, I wanted to point out a couple of things. This includes the, the reuse, the adaptive reuse of the concourse corridor connector to allow bypassing the passengers that bypass the construction site um, around the nodes as well as the end of concourse C and D where we're going to have to reconstruct the building. Um, next slide. Please. So um, in order to kind of achieve that work, we've got to rearrange the, the ticket lobby and do some other works. And that's kind of the, the big focus of this presentation and this request from the commission. So um, 
the end of this year, the end of the summer to the fall period, we're going to rearrange the ticket lobby a little bit. Uh, Southwest Airlines right now um, is in the middle of the center section of ticket lobby with the concourse E extension and terminal balancing. They will move to where United used to be um, next to the South Throats. Um, at that point, we'll take Delta Airlines, uh, move them down to the center section, pretty much where Southwest was, and then also take the series of common use carriers that are to the south of Alaska Airlines and move them into the middle section. Next slide. We'll also require the to take the South Security checkpoint lanes and move them further out into the middle of the node. So um, this is probably a good time to talk about schedules. So right now we're looking at uh, November of 2020 to do this work, but this was prior to prior to COVID hitting us. Uh, but Actually, right now, the South Security Checkpoint Lane is shut down because of the low passenger demand. So the team's trying to evaluate if we can get the design uh, quickly completed, get the permits for it, get the contractors to do the work, and do this uh, portion of the project earlier um, when it's less disruptive to the passengers. So November timeframe at the latest, hopefully a little bit early, we'll move the South Security Lanes to the middle of the node, displace the uh, the the flight information uh, rocket ship that's there, and they'll move out closer to the Stumptown area. Next slide. Um, when the security lanes moved, when the ticket counters move, we'll then open up uh, new throats for the passengers to access security. Uh, so towards the end of this year, towards early next year, uh, those throats will open. So basically the passengers, instead of going through the existing throats, um, will transition to the new throats. And then when that's complete, April of next year, next slide, uh, we'll build a construction barrier uh, floor to ceiling um, around the construction site. Uh, the barrier at the back of the ticket counters is pretty much the existing wall that you see at the ticket counters, but then everything behind, everything from uh, the north-south nodes is an entire new barrier that allows us to do all the construction activities really isolated from the passengers. And from a passenger's experience standpoint, it's very similar to what they will have today. Ticketing will stay um, with the reorganization uh, very similar. Uh, the passengers will still go through a north and south throat and they'll just access security in a little different orientation. Uh, next slide. So from a schedule standpoint, uh, everything is still on schedule, although there's uh, certainly some impacts we're seeing right now from the COVID standpoint. I wanted to talk about uh, Concourse B a little bit. We're taking advantage of um, the low demand right now to combine the Concourse B project into really one bigger project. Um, we were doing everything from B3 B4, as well as the new ground loads facilities in phase one, which was going to be done in the summer of 2021. And then we're going to come back in and reconstruct gates B1 and B2. Because of the lower demand right now, we have an opportunity to take that, um, the entire footprint of Concourse B and do it in one uh, construction package, which will enable us to save about a million and a half dollars. Uh, we're finalizing the schedule. It uh, pushes the first portion of the project out, but brings uh, brings the entire project in by about two and a half to three months. Uh, so we're looking at getting B done uh, towards the end of the summer, early fall of 2021. Uh, and right now we're still on schedule that when terminal balancing completes uh, June, July timeframe, we'll start the work for the Western expansion construction for the utilities that commission approved uh, last month. Next slide. So to date, Commission has approved about $276 million for uh, the Hoffman Skanska contract. It includes uh, a little over $5 million for pre-construction services in May of 2018. Um, uh, Concourse B work uh, from March of 19 and September of 19, both enabling projects to relocate the Alaska um, operations to the end of Concourse C, as well as the main construction contract uh, starting March and July of 2019, we took advantage of uh, the complexity of the t -Core project and the opportunity to uh, combine some other projects to save money and brought the passenger boarding bridges and the terminal relamp project um, into 
the T Corps project. Um, in the last four or five months, commissions approved the main portions, the kickoff of the T Corps project, which includes uh, the development of the occupant safety plan, uh, the weather station building, building 5420, which is over by the fire station, fit up for uh, the contractor utilization for logistics. And then over the last couple of months, the bigger project or bigger contracts, the logistics center, prefab yard, column enabling work, and then just last month, the piling subcontractors. And I thought the image uh, Vince showed of the Packer project is really a good explanation of what the piles and the pile caps will will look like as we go forward, as well as the site uh, utility work that will prep for the construction of the Western expansion. Next slide. Um, going forward, and these are some contracts we're really looking at in the in the, in the realm of and how can we accelerate some areas and delay others. But right now we're looking at uh, July timeframe coming up with um, the building structure and the roof and some of that may adjust a little bit money with about 150 million a continued logistics in August and then towards the end of the year the demo of the uh, building some earlier mechanical and electrical work and then in 2021 the guaranteed maximum price for the remainder and we may see that splitting a little split up a little bit too. Next slide. Thank you. Uh, budget, we are still tracking to the uh, $1.6 uh, billion overall project. We're still on schedule and still on and still on budget for the project. Um, as Vince was talking about, it's been funded through the Airline Cost Center. Um, we're still tracking to our small business participation goals for both design um, and construction, although in design we're a little bit under, but we anticipate getting there, especially with some of this uh, enabling work that they're able to give to um, to award to some of the smaller subcontractors. Next slide. Uh, as I said, commissions approved 276 million uh, to date with the Hoffman Skanska. Uh, team with this amendment, uh, their total contract will be a little over $307 million. Next. And staff recommends uh, approval of the executive director's recommendation. Uh, thank you, George. I have to say I appreciate looking for opportunities to move work forward while there are fewer people in the terminal. Um, I, I was going to ask that question, and obviously you guys have been putting a lot of thought into it, so thanks for that. Questions or comments from the Commission? Okay. Uh, hearing none. Sorry, I, I lost you there for but, a minute. Oh, I, I was asking for Commission questions, and I, I didn't hear any, so I, I will um, ask for a motion and second to approve the Executive Director's recommendation. So moved. Second. Second. Thank you. Pam, will you lead us through the roll call? Commissioners Alexander. Aye. Corporal Comas. Aye. Lamb. Aye. Levy. Aye. McDonald. Aye. Nimi. Aye. O'Halloran. Aye. Pierce. Aye. Saruta. Aye. Thank you. Uh, we'll have Keith Livet for our final agenda item. Great. Uh, thank you. Uh, so I don't know how to segue from uh, slides with a billion dollars on it to, to a Rivergate lease. This is a relatively small lease but i will say in our in our industrial portfolio this is a very important lease particularly given the economic situation that we're uh, we're facing so this agenda item request to enter into a ground lease with 10x uh, this is a company that really is part of the supply chain for the steel industry uh, which is a key industry sector uh, within rivergate as well as within our state uh, these types of manufacturing operations are a good, a good piece of providing quality uh, jobs in our region. 
Uh, with us today to uh, represent to present this item is Debbie Collard, our senior manager of uh, property management and contracts administration in our commercial commercial properties group. Debbie, go ahead. Yeah, thank you, Keith. Um, good morning, everyone. I'm here today to request approval to enter into a ground lease with 10X Management Limited in accordance with the terms presented to the commission. I'm going to talk a little bit about the site, then I'll talk a little bit about 10X Management Limited and their operations, and then I'll present the business terms. Next slide, please. The site is a relatively small uh, site in Rivergate. Um, it sits between Columbia Grain and um, I'm sorry, it sits between sits between Columbia Export Terminals and the Portland Bulk Terminals. Um, it's approximately 14.3 acres and has 600 feet of waterfront. It's accessed using the Terminal 5 access road. Improvements on this site include a warehouse that's approximately 250,000 square feet. There's a parking lot and yard area that's about five acres and then the dock in the Willamette River. Um, just as way of background, the port originally uh, ground leased this property to STC Submarine Systems in 1988. Um, they constructed the facility. It was highly specialized and used to manufacture um, submarine communications cable, which was then laid um, to connect the coast of the U.S. to Japan. Um, STC continued to ground lease the property until they assigned the lease to 10X in 2006. And just as a note, the site is located outside of the boundary of the Portland Harbor Superfund. Next slide, please. 10X has occupied the site since 2006. Um, since that time, they and their affiliates have operated the warehouse to import, distribute, process, and store raw materials that are used in the steel industry. They receive bulk materials, mostly um, ferrous alloys that are processed and packaged and then distributed by truck or rail. Um, you can see the photo shows the inside of the warehouse um, and it is definitely an industrial use. Um, their operations also fall within the critical manufacturing sector as determined by CISA. CISA is the Federal Cybersecurity and Infrastructure Security Agency, and it finds that these types of operations are crucial to economic prosperity and continuity. Their workforce consists of 11 employees. Um, the jobs have low barriers to entry and provide competitive benefits. The salaries range from $30,000 to $70,000 annually. We had uh, scheduled a walkthrough of this for facility for the week of March 16th, which of course was the first week that port employees were directed to work remotely. We decided not to conduct that visit and the broker involved in the transaction actually did a walkthrough and provided us with a series of video clips. Um, should note that the lease has been in holdover since June of 2018 and during that period of time 10X has worked to address some property management issues. Um, that included removal of old equipment, scrap, and rolling stock that had been stored in the parking area in the yard, and then also removal of some materials in the warehouse that are no longer germane to their operations. Next slide, please. The new lease will be retroactive uh, to June 18, 2018. Um, it, the business terms include an initial term of 20 years with one option to extend for an additional 10 years. Rent will be um, approximately 440,000 annually. In addition to rent, they'll pay common area maintenance fees. It's a triple net lease, which means they pay all insurance, taxes, maintenance, and utilities. Rent will escalate by 3% annually. Uh, we structured the transaction so that 10X will own and maintain all of the improvements, including the dock. They do have the right to sublease the property, um, provided um, it doesn't interfere with operations of adjacent tenants and we have to consent to any sublease. Um, at termination, the port has the right to require demolition of improvements, and so that was an important thing to us. Um, and we will be paying a broker commission in accordance with the port policy. Next slide, please. With that, staff recommends approval of the executive director's recommendation. Thank you. 
Thank you very much. Uh, any questions or comments from commission? Okay, hearing none, I'll call for a motion and second to approve the executive director's recommendation. So moved. Second. All those in favor? I'm sorry, Pam, we need the roll call. Yes, Commissioner, Commissioners Alexander. Aye. Corporal Comas. Aye. Lamb. Aye. Levy. Aye. McDonald. Aye. Mimi. Aye. O'Halloran. Aye. Pierce. Aye. And Saruta. Aye. Wonderful. Thank you very much, Commissioners. The meeting is adjourned. Thank you. Maybe next Thank month. Bye-bye. Thank you. Stay safe. Thank you all.